Okay, here we are. Good afternoon. My name is Tracy Paff Smith, and I am the Executive Director of the Huntington Historical Society. So glad that you've joined us today on this rainy day for our virtual lunch and learn. And I'm thrilled to have Carly Wurzelbacher from the Heckscher Museum of Art join us today as our speaker. Just a few housekeeping things before I pass it over to Carly. If you would, please make sure you are muted so that we don't have any disruptions. And we ask that you turn your camera off just so there are no distractions, especially if you're eating your lunch, uh, which we certainly welcome, but uh, if you'll just shut your camera off. Uh, also, if you have any questions, that chat box that we were using, please put your questions in there and we'll address those at the end. Make sure you're specific if you're talking about a specific slide because we won't know which image you're talking about by the time we get to the end. Um, all right. Let's see here, why is my thing not turning? There we go. There we go. I want to especially thank our sponsor of our virtual lunch and learn, People's United Bank. They were sponsoring our in-person and have very kindly continued their support for our virtual events. So we're so glad to have them. I don't know if anybody from Peoples is on today, but if you are, thank you so much. Um, also, thank you to everyone who made a donation when you signed up. We really, really appreciate it. And hopefully we'll be able to welcome you again in person for our actual lunch and learns. But in the meantime, it's great, especially on a day like today where it's really rainy out and you don't even have to leave your house. All right, a couple of events we have coming up. This weekend, we have our outdoor antique sale which is gonna be all day Saturday, all day Sunday. It is 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. We're gonna have over 20 antiques vendors. They're gonna be all across our Kassam property. We have a barn sale that supports the Huntington Historical Society. Our antiques and collectible shop's gonna be open. It's gonna be really a great, great event. And the weather looks pretty nice, so that's excellent news. So please, please come by 434 Park Avenue, the red and white house. I'm sure you've passed it a million times if you've never been there. Um, our next Lunch and Learn is going to be Thursday, April 29th, and that is going to be about Jupiter Hammond, who is the first African-American poet published in uh, North America, and he was born a slave, learned to read and write. It's a fascinating story, and he lived right here in Huntington, and that's going to be our speaker with Preservation Long Island, so that should be really, really interesting. I'll send the information out when I send out the link to this presentation. And we've started back our old burying ground tours, which is the cemetery behind the Soldiers and Sailors building right in the heart of the village. We'll be offering that once a month. Uh, the next one is Saturday, May 15th. And all that information can be found on our website. All right, so without further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Okay. Carly, if you want to get your slides loaded. Mm -hmm. All right, so it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Carly Wurzelbacher joined the Heckscher Museum of Art as curator in 2019. A specialist in 20th century American art, she has worked at the Baltimore Museum of Art in Maryland and the Columbus Museum of Art in Ohio. She earned a PhD in art history from the University of Delaware. We're so thrilled to have you, Carly. Thank you so much. I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Um, hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Tracy, for the invitation to talk about the Heckscher Museum's history. This is very timely because, I'll, as I'll mention, we have an exhibition on this topic uh, coming up in June. So today I'm going to be giving everyone a preview of what is in that show. Um, and I imagine um, chatting for, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, and then having questions at the end. Um, before I dive into the show opening in June, I wanted to just quickly locate us. So in case you're not familiar, the Heckscher Museum is in Heckscher Park in Huntington Village. We're at 2 Prime Avenue. Um, and I wanted to mention that the shows that we're opening this weekend, actually. Um, so the first show we're hanging it on the walls right now is called Long Island's Best Young Artists at the Heckscher Museum. Uh, this is a program that we've been doing for 25 years now. It is island-wide. 
Um, and we receive this year uh, over 330 submissions from high school students. Um, it's an extremely difficult process to jury that so that we're selecting only 80, 80 or so artworks to show on the walls. Um, and so what I'm sharing with you here are the top four prize winners, um, but really all of the work is fantastic. Um, this is a great program because the students make art in response to work that they've seen at the Heckscher. So um, they're really tasked with not only coming up with a, a successful image formally or aesthetically, but they also have to write a statement that outlines why they um, chose to make what they did and how it relates to the work at the museum. So that is opening this weekend. It's a very vibrant time at the museum. Um, and also, if you haven't visited us yet, I wanted to mention the exhibition that has been on view for a while, and it will um, be up until May 23rd. It is called Wood Gaylor and American Modernism. We were so happy to be a critic's pick in the New York Times with this exhibition. Um, and Wood Gaylor is an American modernist. Um, he worked in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s. And he actually lived on Long Island in Great Neck. Um, and this is the first museum presentation um, solo show of his work. Uh, so this is an important show to see uh, before it comes down in May. Um, and then I wanna turn now to the topic of um, the talk today, which is our 100th anniversary uh, exhibition, opening June 5th, um, celebrating the museum's birthday. Uh, really, this is like a hundred, hundred plus one. <laughs> this is the show that we meant to open uh, last year during the pandemic, 2020. Um, we're very happy to have it on view uh, this year. Um, so this afternoon, I am going to talk about three, um, three chapters or three aspects of the Heckscher Museum that have really defined who we are and that continue to shape who we are as an institution. So the first of these uh, is our founding by August and Anna Atkins Heckscher. So I'm going to speak about that. Then I'm going to talk about our connection to George Gross, who is an internationally renowned artist, uh, one of the most important artists of the 20th century, um, who lived in Huntington uh, during the last decade of his life. And we have uh, one of his masterworks in the collection. And then I am going to also speak about Arthur Dove and Helen Tour. Um, again, two major American artists um, with very close ties to Huntington and Centerport. Um, and I'll just mention that almost everything that I am illustrating today is something that you could see in our 100th anniversary exhibition. So. Um, the Historical Society is lending some ephemera to us, so that will be on view, and then the artwork that I'm showing will be on view also, so you'll be able to see all of this in person. Um, so the museum opened to the public on July 10, 1920, in a very festive uh, celebration, a dedication day, and so I'm sharing here a photo I don't know exactly if it's from Dedication Day, but it very well could be. Um, this was shared by Bill Walsh. Um, so thank you, Bill, for sharing that. Um, and then I'm also showing you an image of August Heckscher, one of our founders, uh, speaking on Dedication Day in Heckscher Park. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about what he said that day um, a little bit later, but really two fantastic um, archival photographs to have. Um, so, the Hecksures, who some of you may know, um, really played an outsized role in shaping the history of Huntington. Um, both of them were very um, civic-minded, progressive, engaged people. Um, they took part in many civic improvement efforts, and Heckscher Park, which I've been mentioning, is probably the most important to the museum's history because it's really in establishing the park that the Hecksures uh, get the idea to have a museum in the park as well. 
So the Heckshers uh, were based in the city. They also had a home um, at Wincoma on Long Island starting in 1898. Um, and in the 1910s, uh, the 19 teens, the Heckshers, um, one of their projects was Heckshire Park, which they uh, played a role in landscaping and um, having athletic fields there. And so the park is dedicated to the public in 1918. Um, at that time, World War I is still going on. And the Heckshers announced that at the conclusion of the war, when uh, building materials become available, the museum will also, or the park will also be home to a museum. So that's kind of a first mention of the beginnings of the Heckshire Museum. Uh, which at that time was called the Huntington Fine Arts Building. So uh, we did not bear the Heckscher's name at the time of our founding. Um, and then they broke ground in 1919 and we opened to the public in 1920. So August Heckscher uh, was from a successful family of German businessmen. He immigrated to the US when he was in his teens. Um, and he went to work with his uncle in mining ventures uh, before eventually going on to make a second fortune in Fifth Avenue real estate. Um, I also want to spotlight his wife here. Uh, her name is um, Anna Atkins Heckscher. She was from Pennsylvania and she was really a partner in his uh, August Heckscher's philanthropic efforts. So I'm showing you a quote here. Um, Mrs. Heckscher inspired, encouraged, counseled, and managed all her husband's efforts in the field of philanthropy and charitable endeavor. Um, I think in part because of her gender and in part because she died um, much earlier than August Heckscher. She passed away in 1924. So the quote that I just shared is from um, her memorial, a program for her memorial, which is at the Huntington Historical Society. Um, I think August has kind of unfairly overshadowed her a little bit. So I just want to um, spotlight her as well as someone who was important in donating the park and the museum to the town. Um, in addition to, so I wanted to share these works uh, because they relate to Heckscher family history. Uh, these are two very rare, actually, uh, sculptures by Emma Stebbins, um, commissioned by August Heckscher's uncle, whose name was Charles August Heckscher. <laughs> and this is the family member that our August Heckscher went into business with. Um, so August Heckscher's uncle commissioned these two marble sculptures, which stand about three feet high each, um, from Emma Stebbins, who was a very important female sculptor, um, American, who worked in Rome um, in the middle of the 19th century. She is important to American art history. She's also an important figure in queer history uh, because she um, lived and, and um, considered herself married to the actress Charlotte Cushman. Um, what's so interesting about these two marble sculptures is that they represent industry and commerce. Um, so we see a miner and a sailor. And these are the kind of fields of business that the Heckshers distinguish themselves in. Um, these works were considered um, pioneering at the time because they are neoclassical. So they take the pose, the material white marble, of classical Roman sculpture, but they're depicting contemporary American figures. Um, so it's kind of marrying the old and the new there. Um, the Heckshers, so I'm showing you here an image of the building, which um, August and Anna Atkins Heckscher paid for um, in the park, which they donated. And then with the donation of the museum, they also gave approximately 185 paintings and sculptures um, to be the collection, the artwork on view on the walls. Um, along with that, they commissioned this beautiful sculpture um, from another important female American artist, um, Evelyn Beatrice Longman. And this work is also celebrating its 100th birthday. <laughs> it was site specific, built for the museum. Um, so also went on view in 1920. 
Uh, actually, anecdotally, it wasn't quite ready on July 10th. Um, so when the building opened, the sculpture uh, you know, wasn't quite finished. Um, but it's pretty fantastic that this work has, you know, it's our, the work that's been on continuous view at the museum for 100 years. Um, so I wanted to spotlight that as well. And what's interesting is that other than these works I've just talked about, we really don't know much about how August and Anna um, formed their collection. What I think is really interesting, um, and, oh, I'm sorry, I neglected to say on the last slide, I wrote this here to remind myself, <laughs> Um, what's especially important about the Heckscher Museum in 1920 is that it's one of the first serious art museums outside of a major urban center. So it's really um, the first of its kind, and I just wanted to underscore that. Uh, before saying, um, we don't know much about how Anna and August formed their collection. Um, I'm sharing an image here from 1906. Um, an image of the interior of their residence. So you can see there are certainly uh, landscape paintings lining the walls here, uh, some of which did come to the museum. Um, but by and large, the Heckshers, the little that we do know about their collecting activity, it's clear that they were buying, in many cases, with the museum in mind. So it's not as if the 185 objects or things that they had had for decades in their house. Uh, they were really forming a museum collection, thinking about, um, you know, so their collection reflects a 1920 idea about what a public museum in America should contain. Um, it's fascinating because two thirds of the donation, um, two thirds of the artworks were European. So I think that reflects a prevailing idea at the time um, that high culture uh, was European culture. Um, so some of the work that will be on view in the 100 show, um, I'm showing you this uh, fantastic um, depiction of the Madonna and Child from 1534. To my knowledge, this is the oldest painting in a public collection on Long Island. Um, I'm also showing you here a portrait because um, the founding collection included many, many uh, portraits of uh, European figures. Um, although, so two thirds of the collection European, one third American, um, by and large, those parameters have continued to define what the Heckscher Museum collects. So we are not an encyclopedic um, museum the way the Metropolitan is, for example. But what I think is interesting is that within that category of European art, the Hecksures were really trying to represent multiple nationalities, multiple genres, so that we have religious painting, portraits, landscapes, um, and also multiple time periods, so stretching from the 16th century um, through the 19th century. I wanted to show you here these two images of Venice because when the museum opened, um, two full walls of the museum were dedicated to just depictions of Venice. Um, so I wanted to share that. And then of the American works, what I think is notice, not notable um, is that the Hecksures collected mostly American landscape paintings from the late 19th in early 20th century. So I'm sharing work by Thomas Moran and Louis Comfort Tiffany. Um, not accidentally, these are two works with ties to Long Island. So that's another aspect of the Hector's founding collection that the museum has carried forward. That um, in addition to collecting artwork that is of national and international importance, um, we also have a place for our local artists. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, particularly about the Thomas Moran, for example, is that this is painted in 1911. Uh, remember, they're thinking about the museum already in 1918. So this is really contemporary art uh, for Heckscher. And again, the museum continues to collect and exhibit the contemporary art of our time in the same way that the Hecksures did. 
Um, I will say though <laughs> that the Hecksures um, seem to not have been a fan of modern or avant-garde art. So they weren't collecting cubism, for example, which was, would have also been the contemporary art of their time. And I'm really excited to show you these images, which are preserved at the Historical Society. And I just love them. They are fantastic glimpse into the museum's history. So you can see um, hanging to the right of the door here is that portrait of Anna Atkins Heckscher that I shared earlier. Uh, this is a Moran hanging to the left of the door. Um, I just love looking at these. <laughs> so I'm gonna show you a few more. And what's another interesting thing about the museum is that when it opened, it was, every inch of wall space was filled. Um, you can see that, uh, a sense of that here. And I'm just calling out for you again, those Emma Stebbins sculptures, um, which will be presented in a very similar way in the upcoming 100 exhibition. We also have a very important bust of George Washington that will be on view. Um, and then you might be wondering why you see a shell uh, on your screen. And that is because um, unlike the museum today, at some point <laughs> between when the museum opened and the 1940s, um, the museum became filled with cases and became a catch-all of sorts for um, minerals, shells, um, kind of strange objects of historical importance, uh, really a sort of a cabinet of curiosities. Um, and those are things that we do not exhibit anymore. And in some cases we've found more appropriate homes for those materials. Uh, but we will show a shell or two in the 100 show, uh, just to give a nod to this history. I have some more um, fantastic images. So here you can see a gallery of all of those portraits that I was describing. Um, what I think is interesting about the way the museum was first installed is that things were grouped by subject matter. And I'm quoting August Heckscher on your screen here because he really had the sense that he wanted to provoke um, discussion and to facilitate comparison. So when I mentioned all of those Venetian scenes, the idea was that visitors could um, compare and contra contrast the styles, the color palettes, the composition or perspective, and that um, people could learn in that way. Um, so I think it's great that even from the beginning, the emphasis is really on education and the public experience. And of course, that's certainly um, at the heart of what we do now. I believe this is the last uh, image that I have to show a kind of a panorama um, of what the museum looked like. And uh, you'll note the bison head uh, hanging above the entryway. That's a work that we have found a new home for. Um, and then I'm just calling out some other works here at the bottom um, that continue to be in the museum's collection. So you'll see that I've dated all of these interior photos circa 1920 to about 1941. Um, and the reason why the dates are so muddy um, is because when the museum opened, as I mentioned, the walls are full. And the idea, I think initially, <laughs> was that um, things would remain static. So the Hecksures built the museum, installed the collection, and then that was it. There were really no um, rotating exhibitions like we have today. And also the collection of paintings and sculptures wasn't really growing. There was no acquisition fund. There was not the idea that the collection would continue to grow and evolve um, other than the addition of those minerals and shells that I've mentioned. Um, so that's something that's very different. Um, and that change, that switch to the kind of museum model that we follow today happened um, around 1942. And that's when the trustees decided that they wanted to partner with institutions like the Metropolitan, the Whitney Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, to bring rotating exhibitions and new artwork to the museum. 
I wanted to share this fun image uh, to talk again about our education programs, which, as I said, go back to 1920. Um, this is the earliest image I've seen, again, from the Historical Society um, of Gladys Stackhouse, who was our first educator <laughs> who worked for the museum. And here she is with her students, her summer art camp students. Uh, we were chatting about that before we formally started the program. So here they all are in the park in 1941. So I love that image and I wanted to share that with all of you. So as I mentioned, the Heckscher's um, founding notions about what the museum should be and collect are something that while we've uh, expanded in some sense, we do still continue to collect European art and American art from the 19th century. So I'm showing you uh, two stunning examples here that have entered the collection in recent decades. Um, these will both be on view in the 100 show. Um, so the next person that I want to talk about uh, is Eva Gatling, and she is really foundational to these next two um, aspects of the museum's identity both our connection to George Gross and our connection to Arthur Dove and Helen Tour. Both of these things um, are initiatives that we could really credit Eva Gatling with. Um, so Eva Gatling was uh, the museum's first professional uh, director, meaning the first person trained in art history, the first person with museum experience. In the early decades of the museum's history, uh, the museum was overseen by the same person who um, oversaw the park. So um, there wasn't a professional staff, as I mentioned, there wasn't really a need to have one, nothing was changing. So it's really Eva Gatling who comes to the museum in 1962, um, stays with us for 15 years. She is one of the first female directors of an art museum in the country. And she really gets us up and running and turns us into the vibrant institution that we are today. So you can see her here in the galleries. She's standing uh, to the far left here is George Gross's Eclipse of the Sun, uh, which I'm gonna talk about. Um, but I had mentioned that the museum collection was not growing. It's really under Eva in the 1960s that a acquisition fund is formed and that major works of art are added to the Heckscher's founding collection. So additions to the collection really don't happen until the early 1960s. So I'm showing you here um, Thomas Aiken's study. Um, the idea was that the museum's collection needed to diversify in all respects. Um, that's something that we still are working on today. In this sense, um, I mentioned that the American collection was all landscapes. So Thomas Aikens, a major American figurative painter, um, seemed like a natural addition to kind of expand on the museum's founding collection. Um, also, I'm showing you a very modern abstract work by Joseph Albers. So the museum's collection is growing in that sense also. Um, and then this is also the time, um, 60s, 70s, uh, that photography enters the permanent collection for the first time. Also, representations of women artists in the collection start to increase, and also African American artists in the collection uh, enter the collection for the first time with Romare Bearden's um, works. And again, um, these are areas of the collection that we hope to grow today. So I want to, oops, to promise to talk about George Gross. So this is the ne kind of next uh, second portion of what I wanted to share with you. So George Gross's connection to the museum um, goes back to around 1947 when he moved to Huntington. And this work that I'm showing you is considered one of his masterworks certainly one of the most important paintings in the Heckscher's collection. And it's, it's an incredibly rich work. 
iconographically. Um, it also has a fascinating provenance and backstory. So I wanted to share some of that with you. Um, so you can see on your screen here, I'm quoting George Gross. He described his work as a reaction against a humanity gone mad. So George Gross um, was a German artist. He painted the work on your screen in Berlin in 1926. It's called Eclipse of the Sun because what you can see here at the top left, uh, we see a symbol for money kind of uh, blotting out the sun's life-giving rays. Um, and we see a group of men gathered around a table. The figure in military dress is Paul von Hindenburg. Um, and I'm listing all of his uh, experiences here on the screen. So he was a leader during World War I. He served as second president of the Weimar Republic during the interwar period between World War I and World War II. Um, it's this period that gives rise to Adolf Hitler. It's a period um, of rampant inflation, poverty, violence, um, a very disturbing time in German history and world history. Um, and a lot of that is what Gross is really skewering in this image. So we see the kind of decorated leader, with really rosy cheeks, um, listening as an industrialist. He's got his uh, trains and his railroads under his arm, and he's whispering in the ear of the government leader. Uh, surrounding the table are mindless bureaucrats. Um, who are not, you know, contributing in a productive way to countering uh, what's going on. Um, and we also have a, um, a donkey on the table who some scholars think is meant to represent the German people. Um, you can't see it in this image, but his eyes are covered with blinders, um, which have a, an eagle on them. And so the idea here is that uh, maybe people can hear everything that's going on. The information is out there, uh, but they deliberately don't want to, to see, to react, uh, to counter um, this period of corruption and violence. Um, so, uh, you know, also there's so much to talk about. Um, at the lower right, you can see the youthful figure of a face, someone who is in, oops, imprisoned and stepped on. Um, so this is possibly the lost German youth or um, the youthful face juxtaposed with the skeleton is kind of a not very subtle um, reference to, you know, what the future is going to look like if Germany continues to go down this path. So it's a very prophetic image also. Um, I've been talking a lot about the people and the symbolism. I think what you can also see in this work is the influence of cubism and futurist aesthetics. So the people are at all different scales. Um, so while some parts of them, like their faces, are rendered somewhat naturalistically, um, other things are not naturalistic at all. So we have a very tilted perspective. We seem to be seeing both inside and outside at the same time. There are some warplanes and smoke in the background. Um, in general, the perspective, the colors, the composition, everything feels very unstable and claustrophobic. Uh, so George Gross is also using uh, visual formal devices like that to communicate with us. Um, and this is a very large, not like this, um, it's huge. This, this is uh, many feet tall. Um, so that's a bit about this painting in particular, I wanted to share more about George Gross's personal history. So as I mentioned, he's working in Berlin in 1926. Um, he, in 1932, receives an invitation to teach at the Art Students League in New York City, and he accepts this invitation. Um, things are heating up for him politically at home. Um, all of his work is uh, was often censored or um, he was arrested on several occasions because of the imagery that he was producing. So the idea of kind of escaping to New York City is 
one that he's interested in. So he comes to the city in 1932, goes back to Germany, but then in 1933 um, moves with his family to New York City and then really stays in the US um, for the remainder of his life. Uh, in the last month or so of his life, he did go back to Berlin. Um, but from 1933 on, he really is an American artist. So I'm showing you here an image of George Gross who continued to make very political art. You can see that in his image here. Um, he's working in his studio in Douglaston, Queens in 1943. As I mentioned, in 1947, he moves with his family uh, to Huntington, and we have some fantastic images of him here. So this is a, a very grainy image <laughs> from the newspaper um, from 1955. You can vaguely see George Gross in the background here, and he is teaching um, for local students. Uh, so he continued to teach at the Art Students League in New York City. He was the instructor uh, for very important American artists such as Romer Bearden, who I mentioned previously, who's in the museum's collection. Um, he also taught art lessons here in Huntington. So he really becomes part of the art community here in a way that I think um, art historians or the larger scholarly uh, field has yet to investigate. Um, and then he also, this photo I just love because here he is standing in front of um, the Longman Fountain of Youth in the museum's lobby. So we can be certain that he came to the Heckscher Museum. Um, here he is handing out prizes um, at, uh, for a local um, artist exhibition. Um, so again, he really becomes part of the art world here in Huntington. Um, while continuing to be an important figure internationally and in the city. The museum's collection includes uh, all three of these works in addition to other works, um, all of which will be on view in the 100 show. And we're really able to track the evolution of Gross's career. So I'm showing you here um, a work possibly from his best known period, the middle 1920s when he's still um, satirizing the upper classes and people in power um, in Germany. Then in 1942, this is a work, um, I Was Always Present, um, which is a kind of a personification of death or violence. So uh, George Gross made work in reaction to World War I. Here he is uh, in the midst of World War II, making work about that material. And then his last body of work is very fascinating and also under-researched. Um, and it's represented here by a work called Movable Feast, um, which is a collage that he made from uh, magazine images. Um, and here I think his target is consumer culture. <laughs> so he's making this in 1958. So this is the post-World War II boom in America. And so he here is skewering um, I think rampant consumerism. So interesting that in our collection we're able to tell the full story of his art making. And I'm showing you this, uh, George Gross on Long Island, because this is an image that relates to our first exhibition at the Museum of Gross's work, which took place in 1959. Um, which is the year that Gross passed away. Um, and all of the work on view in this exhibition was drawn from the collection of uh, Long Island residents. So I think it's fascinating to think that we were able to mount an entire exhibition drawn solely from private collectors who lived on Long Island. So again, that's another testament to how um, involved Gross was in our local art scene. And we, of course, have continued to show Gross's work many times since 1959. Um, so I wanted to tell you now more about the story of how Eclipse of the Sun came to be at the Heckscher. Um, so the painting, as I mentioned, made in Berlin, 1926. Um, George Gross comes to uh, New York City, 1932-33. 
and the painting is presumed lost. Um, the, the only time it was shown in public was in Germany in 1926. Uh, we don't know of any instances that Gross showed it publicly during his lifetime. Um, so the painting kind of disappears from view. No one seems to know where it is. And the museum has done some research and kind of uncovered a fascinating tale that seems to suggest that George Gross traded or bartered the painting uh, to someone who was doing some um, plumbing or construction work for him. Uh, this person in turn bartered the painting to someone else. Um, and ultimately this masterwork um, ends up in the uh, home of someone named Thomas Constantine, who contacted the museum, um, the Heckscher Museum in the late 1960s and said, I have this incredible painting. Um, Eva Gatling, our pioneering director who I mentioned, to her credit, really recognize the importance of this work, which may seem obvious to us now. Um, but again, this painting was totally off the radar. Um, no one knew what had happened to it, and it was in need of conservation. Um, and Eva Gatling did something remarkable, which is that she reached out to the community. And so I'm showing you here uh, a subscription book. Um, Eva Gatling invited uh, community members, people in Huntington and elsewhere, to chip in to collectively purchase and restore this work and to put it on view at the Heckscher Museum. And I have my little orange arrows here <laughs> to show that uh, really the range of people who contributed. So we have um, Nelson Rockefeller chipping in. Um, we also have the students of Huntington High School um, and then I'm flagging here um, Stan Brodsky, who some of you may know as an important Long Island artist who's represented in the museum's collection. So this really represents a remarkable coming together of the community to preserve this work and to um, keep Gross's legacy alive in Huntington. And the subscription book will also be on view in the 100 show. So I'm excited to um, show some more of the ephemera and old photographs that we don't normally get to exhibit at the museum alongside the artwork that they relate to. And I'm showing you this very grainy, again, a newspaper photograph of the Huntington High School students who put together the fundraising drive to um, contribute to the purchase of the painting. So these are all the students presenting their check to Eva Gatling. And then um, just to show you how this painting continues to live on in Huntington, I mentioned at the beginning of our talk today, our program, The Long Island's Best uh, Exhibition of High School Student Artwork. And I mentioned how the students are tasked with finding inspiration and in work in the permanent collection. And George Gross' The Eclipse of the Sun has been fascinating students for decades. So I'm showing you here just two examples um, of high school students who made their own uh, riffs on Gross's work. So I would like to turn now <laughs> to the third topic that I wanted to address today, um, which is also another um, endeavor that I would credit to Eva Gatling. So here I'm showing you an image of her um, with the town supervisor and with uh, Ruth Solomon, who worked at the museum. They're standing in front of Arthur Dove's painting, um, an important work from 1941 that was acquired in 1972. So again, the 60s, early 70s are really the first time that the museum is adding work to the collection. Um, and it's to Eva's credit that um, as she did with George Gross, she really became very interested in preserving the legacies of Arthur Dove and Helen Tour. Um, Arthur Dove is considered one of the first, if not the first, American artists to experiment with abstraction, pure abstraction. Um, and so he, you know, has a major part in American art history books uh, for that reason. Um, 
And then his wife, Helen Tour, was also a very important artist, um, like Arthur Dove. She was a contemporary of Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, so here I'm showing you Arthur Dove, Helen Tour, and this, the boat that they lived on. <laughs> so Arthur Dove and Helen Tour are making their groundbreaking work um, on the Long Island Sound, literally. Um, Helen Tour painted on the, their boat, the Mona. Um, Arthur Dove and Helen Tour lived on the boat. This is our primary residence from 1924 to 1934. They would often dock uh, in Huntington Harbor, but they would sail up and down the sound. Um, and a lot of the subject matter um, or inspiration for their important works are taken from the local landscape and their experience here. Um, and it's to Eva Gatling's credit that she recognized the importance of that. Oops, going backwards. Okay. I wanted to share with you some examples of Helen's, Helen Tours' work. Uh, so you can see her work here, Oyster Steaks, based on Huntington Harbor, a Huntington Harbor scene. Um, it's representational to a point. You can see her subject matter, but she's really emphasizing here the patterning and the rhythm of the waves and the, the formation of the clouds in an interesting way. Um, I'm showing you also a work uh, related to a piano, um, kind of an abstract depiction of music. Um, both Helen and Arthur would also go on walks and collect materials like shells and feathers. And these things would become the subject matter of their still life paintings. Uh, so all of the work that I'm showing you here is from the museum's permanent collection. So here we have a, an abstracted rendition of a seashell, another work called Feather and Shell. And then this work, uh, which is in the collection of the, the Phillips Collection in Washington, DC, which depicts Heckscher Park, which is so fantastic. Um, so we know that Arthur and Helen visited Heckscher Park and almost certainly visited the museum, saw the founding collection. Um, you know, they were around starting in 1924. That's four years after we were founded. So we can imagine Arthur Dev and Helen Tour as some of our first uh, visitors. And then um, in 1934, uh, Helen and Arthur leave Long Island for um, uh, an interval. They are settling the estate of Arthur Dove's parents. This is in the middle of the Great Depression. Um, they go to Geneva, which is where both of these works were painted. Um, they live in Geneva, New York, which is where Dove's family was from. And then they are desperate uh, to come back to Long Island, where um, they had loved so much and found so much inspiration. So in 1938, they move back to Long Island and they move into this building, which we call the Dove Tour Cottage. It's um, the address is 30 Center Shore Road. Uh, this cottage, which is quite small, <laughs> um, is their final home. So they moved there in 1938. Um, Arthur Dove dies in the late 40s. Helen Tour lives in this home until her death in 1967. Um, the building is on the National Register of Historic Places. We are a member of the National Trust's Historic Artists Homes and Studios Program. Um, and the museum um, acquired this property in 1998, again, because we had this long relationship with Arthur Dove and Helen Tour and wanted to preserve their local legacy. Um, I'll show you some more images so that you can get a sense what's important about this structure. Uh, here's a map. So you can see they're right on the water here um, in center port. And this is another image possibly taken uh, around 1938, which is when they made this their home. You can see that the building is almost literally directly on the water. <laughs> this is important because of the views. So the home is small. Um, when almost as soon as Arthur Dove and Helen Tour moved here, um, Arthur had a series of heart attacks. He was really in very poor health. Um, I think 
you know, the pandemic has given me a new perspective on their life because Arthur Dove um, was ill and ailing. He was really confined to his home and the immediate surroundings, although he did get to New York City and other places on occasion. Um, but this, his house was really his world. And he spent a lot of his time looking out the window at the light, playing on the water, um, other houses in the area. And this is really what fueled his production um, until his death. Uh, the pandemic has also given me a new perspective on Helen Tor, who really struggled for recognition during her lifetime, um, mostly because she was a, a female artist. Her work was not taken seriously. She was really in the shadow of Arthur Dove um, and her friend Georgia O'Keeffe. And um, she was very frustrated by the end of her life. And she ended up, uh, to the extent that we can tell, it seems as if she really gave up her painting career in order to become Arthur Dove's primary caretaker. Um, I'm showing you again an image so you get a sense of where their home is in relation to the water. Uh, in fact, their house is so close to the water um, that they would flood periodically and they actually built a false floor to just raise themselves up about four or five feet. Um, so really they had a, a very direct <laughs> um, experience with the environment, both living on the boat and then living um, on the banks of the mill pond in Centerport. The building has a history that goes back further than when Arthur and Helen lived there. Um, I'm showing you here an image of the building when it served as the Centerport Post Office. Some of you may be able to read that on the sign there um, and also a general store. So you can see the canned goods uh, stacked in that front window. Um, which, which thankfully is still extant. Uh, and then here's an image of Arthur and Helen with friends um, from the period where they lived in the house. And here's an example of one of those abstractions that I was talking about. So um, this is a work that Helen, or I'm sorry, that Arthur made in 1941. Uh, that's one year before he passes away. And uh, while this is an abstract work, um, you can see the hint of water and the blue and green strip below and then you get the sense of uh, refracting sunlight whether sunrise or sunset uh, over the water so you can see those warm colors in the sky and the top uh, we have many works uh, like this in the permanent collection i didn't put the dimensions here but they're quite small so they're very intimate um, they, not a lot of help, not a lot of space in that house to make gigantic works. Um, but we have a wealth of these small scale watercolors. I wanted to share this image, which is the only one that I know of, of the interior of the Dove Tour Cottage. So this is Helen Tour reclining. Uh, what is so fantastic about this image is look at all the artwork on the walls around her. And I'm calling out uh, specifically uh, this Georgia O'Keeffe um, by their friend and peer, um, now in the collection of the Newark Museum of Art. So this very modest home on um, the mill pond was really a, a major center of modern American art. Um, also on the walls, you can see works by Arthur uh, and photographs by the photographer Arthur Stieglitz. Um, the Heckscher I mentioned uh, has had a long history of championing the legacies of these work, these artists and their work, and also connecting their work to uh, this place where we live, uh, Huntington. So we presented Arthur Dove of Long Island Sound in 1967. Um, the show I really want to call out is the one that Eva Gatling put on in 1972 of Helen Tor's work. Um, this was groundbreaking because, as I mentioned, Helen had effectively stopped working. Um, her work had never been presented in a museum. Upon um, Helen's death, she left her sister instructions to destroy all of her life's work, which was stored in the attic of the Dove Tour Cottage. 
So I think that's another evocative image. You can imagine Helen Tor uh, living in this little cottage from 1938 till 1967 with her life's work kind of literally um, stored away in the attic right above her. Fortunately, Helen's sister meets with Eva Gatling at the Heckscher. Eva Gatling says, absolutely not. <laughs> you cannot destroy the, your sister's work. Uh, please don't follow her instructions. And Eva Gatling um, works with Ron Pisano, who's a figure I'll mention soon, um, to catalog all of Helen's work and to present the first museum uh, show, retrospective and monograph of Helen's work. Um, her work, Helen Tor's work, is now in the collections of the Metropolitan Museum. I'm showing you that here, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. Um, this literally could not have taken place without the Heckscher Museum. And I think it really speaks to the importance of regional art museums. Um, this is one of the many cases in which the Heckscher literally rewrote art history. And I think that is um, also part of our core identity. The last thing I'll mention is that we also uh, have an archive of Arthur Dev and Helen Tor's materials. Um, many, many glass jars of beautiful pigments. You can read on the front here, perhaps it says Mrs. Arthur Dove Centerport. Um, so that's an important resource. And that's really the material I wanted to share with you for today. I'm excited to talk with you about it more. Um, I just brought in a few images so that you can get a sense of the Heckscher's history in recent years. Um, some other masterworks that will be in the 100 show. This is by Howard Dana Pindell, who's a longtime professor at Stony Brook. Um, we had a major exhibition of her work in the 1990s. I wanted to share this beautiful Jane Wilson, uh, another Long Island artist uh, who we showed her work in 2000. And then in 2001, we received our largest donation of artwork in the museum's history, uh, hundreds of works from the collection of Fred Baker and Ron Pisano. Um, so we really owe a thanks to them for the shape that the museum has taken in recent decades. Uh, these are some of the works in that collection of beautiful Joseph Stella, Georgia O'Keeffe, and Florian Stettheimer, all of which you can see in the 100 show. And then the 100 show will also include some new acquisitions. Um, I'm showing you here a kind of an avant-garde still life assemblage by Stella Waitskin, who is an artist who lived for a time in Great Neck before moving to the Chelsea Hotel. Uh, and then a work by Robert Carter, who is an artist who lives in Dix Hills and has been teaching at Nassau Community College for more than 50 years. Uh, so those are new things that even if you're a frequent visitor to the museum, you will not have seen these objects. And lastly, I wanted to ask you all, um, I'm excited to talk about this in the Q, oops, in the Q&A. Uh, but I wanted to share that we um, have an initiative called My Hecture Story, where we're really looking for exactly the type of stories that you all were sharing in the chat uh, when we started the program today. Um, any photos you have, um, any information, I think always, but especially in our anniversary year, we really want to capture that community history. So if you have photos or stories, um, please share them with us. Uh, you can do that on the internet or you can call me. Um, I mentioned Bill Walsh earlier, who I think is watching. Uh, I showed the fantastic image of all the ladies in the hats. Uh, he reached out to me with that recently. So please, if you have any material, um, we're all ears. And with that, I'd love to know um, your questions and comments. Terrific, Hurley. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. That was amazing. It was like we were right there in the museum with you. All right, we have a few comments. Um, I hope I'm not going to mispronounce your name, and I think I, I think I will. But it, like Shari, maybe, um, joined us from Northport and mentioned that they were new to the area. So just wanted to, to say a special welcome. Our first question from Megan. Uh, she was wondering 
the bison head that you mentioned was sort of rehomed. She's wondering where that ended up, if you know. Uh, I believe um, it's now at the Vanderbilt uh, Museum and Planetarium, so still in the area. How appropriate. Okay. Yes. That's wonderful. Um, Hillary said she had to leave for a doctor's appointment, but she wanted to share. She had a painting at the Heckscher years ago as a student at the Long, Long Island Art League. She was so flattered and excited to be selected. So I'll send her that information that you shared at the end, how you're collecting those stories, because that sounds great. Okay. Um, Bruce says, wonderful job. I learned a lot. Other Bruce um, says, what a wonderful presentation. Gives me a new appreciation for the Dove Tour House on Center Shore Road. Um, excellent presentation from John and Grace. There's a question, how were Helen Tour's works distributed after her death? That's a good question. So um, many, so, uh, a significant portion of them stayed at the Heckscher. So we have the largest publicly held collection of her work. Um, but at the same th time, I think Eva Gatling was smart in recognizing that to champion Helen Tour, uh, we really needed to place her work in other collections so that other people across the country and the world could share in her story. So um, the museum partnered with a commercial gallery who was able to sell and place works, um, you know, because I think to keep as much as I would love to have everything by Helen Tor at the Heckscher, that really would not have served um, her, her legacy. So I think it was very important that the museum facilitated getting her work out into the world more broadly. So Eva Gatling had a hand in that, not only in, in sort of saving it and putting it out there, but she helped distribute the works. That's yes. amazing. What yes. an amazing woman. Yeah, she did so much. All right, Janet says, thanks for a great presentation. Will you ever bring back a Dale Chihuly exhibit? The last one was fantastic. Yeah, it's possible. Um, nothing in the works right now, but I, you know, I never say never. And I think um, definitely his work looks beautiful in the museum and, and that would be a popular show. So it's certainly possible. It would be nice out in the park too. Yes. They started integrating a little more with the outside. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, that would be beautiful. All right, Kay asks, can we tour the Dove and tour Cottage this summer? Uh, yes, so the Cottage is, if you ever watch um, like home renovation shows, HGTV, I would say the Cottage is in the demo stage. <laughs> so um, all the later additions, uh, you know, that that dated to after when Helen Tour lived there, those have all been removed, um, but we've yet to fully interpret and restore the house to the way that it was when Arthur and Helen lived there. So that's a multi-year project that we're working on, um, made challenging by things like the flooding that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing we are doing, we've done in recent years and we're doing again this summer, is um, inviting local artists to do outdoor painting on the grounds. So I don't know that we'll be inside the structure. Um, it's also very small. So for social distancing reasons, I don't know that we can have people inside. Um, but I, I am thinking about if it's feasible to hold an open house, um, but certainly uh, we hope to make that building more accessible to the public um, in recent months and in the coming years. Okay. And so you could contact the museum or check our website for more about that. More information, okay, terrific. I would love to see it myself. Yeah. Okay, Bill asks, oops, somebody else has bumped it up here. Bill says, I seem to recall hearing of expansion plans for the Heckscher Museum of Art, any news? No, but that is a, a very good point. Um, as I mentioned, almost from the first day we opened, we were bursting at the seams. Um, and that has certainly been the case in the hundred years that have followed. Um, and as Bill is remembering, there have been um, floated at different periods, starting also with Eva Gatling, the idea of getting some more square footage for the museum. 
So at that, at this point, we're not um, actively working on that, although it's something we always hope and dream about. <laughs> um, so I hope that answers the question. So not at present, although I think it does remain a need um, and something that we will keep exploring. Maybe for long term, okay. Yeah. Uh, Megan said she really enjoyed this and learned a lot. Thank you. Love the park and museum. My favorite was walking over the bridges. Uh, Kay said, did Ms. Gatling go to another museum after Huntington? So she retired after um, working at the museum. She, when she left, she joked that she wanted to leave something for the next person to do. Um, <laughs> but she said it if her predecessor, you know, didn't get these other things done, she was going to come out of retirement and, and come back and get back to work. Um, but she had worked at many museums before coming to the Heckscher. Um, and she had been, so she had worked at the Cranbrook Academy, for example, in Michigan. Um, she, but she would always rise in the ranks, uh, but she could never quite get that director job. Um, people were not, did not want to offer it to a woman. And so the Heckscher um, was the first place where she was really able to realize that goal. Um, but she was quite late in her career by that point. So when she retired, um, she retired, uh, I believe, to South Carolina. Um, and so she did not go on to any other institution. Okay. Allison. Uh, who, if you missed in the beginning, Allison is joining us from Germany and is a former intern yes. uh, at the Heckscher. She says, such a wonderful lecture. Thank you. I can't wait to visit. I didn't know about Eva Gatling, and she is a fascinating figure. Agreed. Uh, okay, oops, I just lost my, here we go. Uh, Janet says, it would be nice to have a before and after virtual tour of the Dove Tour Cottage because it's so small. Yes, that's, that's, that's a good thought. And I think uh, um, the pandemic, you know, for all of its bad things, a silver lining is that it has opened our eyes, I think, to what we can do with technology. So, you know, despite the small footprint of the building, I think virtual tours are an excellent idea, um, even once we are physically open to the public. Um, I think that's a way that we can share the space with more people. So that's a great idea. That is a great idea. All right, that looks like the end of our questions. If you have any other questions, put them in now. Carly, would you remind us about when the exhibit opens? Absolutely. So the 100 show opens on June 5th. Um, because it's uh, really such a major show, it will be on view uh, for a number of months um, into January 2022. But I would encourage you to come um, Come often, <laughs> a favorite quote from 1921 from the Brooklyn Daily Eagle reporting on the new museum said that people come and come again to this treasure house of theirs. <laughs> so we certainly would like you to visit as many times as you would like. And then I would also mention that um, on September 23rd, so halfway through the exhibition, uh, many of the works, uh, more than a dozen, will be going off view and new things will be coming on view um, that is in part uh, to protect works on paper, um, but also because, for example, the section of the show on new acquisitions, we've just had so many new, new exciting acquisitions, we want to have those all on view. Um, so the show will be changing throughout those seven months. Oh, that's great. So come and come again. Yes. <laughs> Uh, for those of us who are joining us from faraway places, will you have any sort of virtual anything, any kind of talk or presentation that you know of coming up? You know, I think we are right now uh, very focused on being able to do these in-person things again, mm -hmm. because we're just so excited to do that. But we will have more virtual programming in the fall. And we've been doing a lot of virtual programming for the last year. And much of that is available um, online now. Uh, talks about the Wood Gaylor Show, um, programming related to our Long Island Biennial. Um, so there's quite a bit of, of digital content on, uh, up on the website now. Okay, terrific. And that's, uh, would you give us your website address? 
Uh, yes, it's Hexure.org. Hexure.org. Okay, I'll send that out in the email as well. Uh, two very last questions that came through. Tom asks, is there a style of art that is specifically identified with the Huntington area? Hmm. That's a good question. I think, um, so the short answer, I think uh, it's multi, multi-fold. <laughs> um, artists of all styles have certainly worked here. And I think that's interesting in itself. I think Huntington is a place where a lot of artists who go to school in the city or who, who go to school at or teach at one of our many colleges or universities have gravitated to Huntington. So I think that's a reason why we have really high caliber art being made throughout history in this area. Um, I, will, I would say that art that represents or is inspired by the landscape is probably a constant throughout the history of Long Island art. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so even Arthur Dev and Helen Tor, who are working very abstractly, are, are still responding to the environment. Um, so I think really a strength or what distinguishes Huntington is the incredible variety of work that's being made here uh, throughout history. Okay, that was a good question, Tom. Yeah. Uh, last question we have is from Bruce. Did L.C. Tiffany affect any buildings besides Ferguson's castle? Yes, I, I don't know. I mean, for the Huntington, and per, uh, the Heckscher uh, in particular, um, did not have a direct relationship with Tiffany other than the fact that um, the Hecksures were collecting his paintings. Um, and now in the collection, so we have his two-dimensional work, and then we have some um, glass objects from the Tiffany Studios. Mm -hmm. But he was not involved in the architecture or design of the building. There's a rumor that our soldiers and sailors building, um, that the windows were, were Tiffany. I don't, I don't think that's founded, but, <laughs> but that would be nice. Yeah. All right, Carly, thank you so, so much for joining us. That was fantastic, and I cannot wait to see the exhibit. Great. Thanks, everybody, for listening. It, it was fun to share all of this material. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, uh, Bushra from People's United Bank. Just a great presentation. Thanks, Bushra. Thank you, everyone. We hope to see you at the end of the month for our next Lunch and Learn, and I'll send all of this out probably tomorrow. All right, we'll see you next time. Okay, thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.